Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out to our second hot talk of the season. Um, tonight we're going to be treated to a history of how we have gotten to the current suburban landscape that we have now. And I believe that Dr. Bush is going to be going all the way back to prehistory to bring us up to that. This lecture series, um, when we started it, was initially focused on the humanities and, and we're broadening it to uh, the rest of academia, but it still has the same focus. We live in a world where you can look up whatever you want on your phone, whatever you want on your computer, and in some ways that has diminished our wisdom. Wisdom comes from the connection between different bits of, bits of facts, different, different bits of knowledge. It is not the knowledge itself. It is the network of connections that we're able to form in our own minds. And in order to achieve that wisdom, we have to have the knowledge inside of us. We have to have things that we can play with in order to grow our understanding of the world, as opposed to just, and I'm sure many of us do this, you see something on TV or you have a thought and you're like, where did that come from? You hit Wikipedia and it's really fun and it's awesome that we have that ability in the modern day. But without having something internalized, there's nothing to play with. And that's what this series is about, is to give us new things to internalize, to understand our world and make more connections for ourselves. So with that being said, without further ado, uh, Dr. Bush got her uh, BS and her Master's of Science in Horticulture from UNL, and she holds her PhD in Educational Administration also from UNL. Um, she has been working for the past 11 years in education, in improving the lives of our students and improving the skills of our students. And we're very lucky to have her with us today. If you could please uh, welcome Dr. Bush to the stage. So if I start talking really fast, it's either because I'm running out of time or because I'm super passionate about plant stuff. So please bear with me. But we're going to go on a little bit of an adventure over the past 2,000 plus years. And hopefully, you'll see a little bit more understanding about your own space. So let's start by having you think about your own landscape. If closing your eyes helps, go ahead and do that. I want you to think about what you see, hear, smell. Okay, so everybody has a good picture about what they have on their property, right? Okay, so we're going to be answering the question today, how did we get here? How did your landscape come to be? How did the experience that you have outside of your home come to exist? So we have a few premises that I want to start with because there are a few things we need to keep in mind as I go through this. First, we have to remember that humans evolved with their landscape. When we start talking about earliest societies, we have to remember we were hunters and gatherers. And today, our landscape has an entirely different meaning. Uh, as history has progressed, humans have become masters of the landscape rather than at the mercy of the landscape. Humans have a huge impact on our landscape as well. In fact, um, we are causing plants to spread at a much faster rate than they have historically. So we're impacting the landscape drastically in the last 2,000 years. Um, I do talk about the middle class uh, at some point during this because that's where the suburban landscape lies, right? Now, the middle class didn't really exist in true fashion until about the 16th century. And when we think about American suburban landscapes, the middle class really came about post-World War II and after labor laws were enacted in the 60s and 70s. Lastly, we want to remember that landscapes reflect a cultural ideal that is a shared concept between people in the same region. But this is going to ebb and flow because we had trade that occurred either by ship uh, across the Atlantic Ocean or along the Silk Road even before that. And I am leaving out all Asian <laughs> cultures for this because I simply only have 60 minutes. But we have to remember that Asia heavily influenced a lot of European culture. So, quick timeline refresher. I know you're all educated, but sometimes we forget how the timeline works. So I just want to remind us that zero is what, in Christianity, we refer to as the birth of Christ. It is just a timeline mark that we measure all time based on. And so I'm using the scientific terminology before Common Era, which is BC, to 
most of us, and then Common Era, which is AD to most of us, right? So keep in mind that if we go 100 years on either side of the timeline, we're going to call that the first century, but it could be the first century before Christ or the first century after Christ. So we have that going for us. We're also currently in the 21st century. So some of my students get confused sometimes when we're talking first century that it is years zero to 100, right? Okay. So early cultures, this is the prehistory portion and we're actually talking prehistory up to about sixth century here. But I wanted to highlight some of the really big cultures that we're familiar with. Now, there were lots of other things that I'm leaving out for the sake of time and argument. But you're probably familiar with Mesopotamia being sort of the fertile crescent, the cradle of life. Um, so I, I listed several of the earliest cultures. The Babylonians had a big role in this, so did the Sumerians. Um, but Persia is present day Iran. So just to kind of help you associate where you're at. Um, and then the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Celts, the Romans, the Nazca, these are all images we're going to briefly look at as we go through this. Um, keep in mind the only ones I have up here that are new world are the Nazca. So everyone else here is essentially a European um, culture. So uh, when I'm shifting timelines, I'm going to kind of try to hit on three big things we need to remember in this time period. Early history, we are talking about polytheistic societies. The reason this is important is because when you are practicing polytheism, you have a belief that there is a god of nearly everything in the world around you. Gods, plural, explain the unknown phenomenon that you cannot explain scientifically. So in these early societies that we go back here and look at, these were all polytheistic. And much of the history of their landscape is related to gods of water, gods of the underworld, gods of thunder, gods of rain. And so the way they interacted with the space around them had a lot to do with deities. There was a strong belief in that. Nature is terrifying at this time in history, but we worship nature. Again, it's that religious deity portion, right? We worship gods of water because they give us crops. Um, at this time in history, we have what we call small cities. Compared to New York, they're tiny. But cities couldn't develop until we had food storage containers, silos. Before that, cities could only be very small. We're talking maybe tens of people, maybe a hundred, but until food storage came to exist in agriculture, cities could not be sedentary. So I take us all the way back, right? I just kind of want us to visualize going all the way back, thinking about how these people are interacting with their landscape. Every single thing in their life has to come from nature. It has to. Their shelter, their food, their water. There's no other choice. At this time in history, they're at the mercy of nature. But we do see some of the earliest, really, uh, forms of writing would be cave paintings at Lacau. And if I pronounce something wrong, I'm sorry, I don't speak French very well. Um, but these earliest cave paintings tell us that. Of, of, Greece putting all of their attention toward thinking about where priorities lie. Uh, moving a little bit toward the Romans, this is a uh, kind of a replicated or a rebuilt version of the house of the Bedii. The Bedii were some brothers that lived in Rome. They were very upper class. And when Mount Vesuvius exploded, um, this was buried. So they were able to dig this out, and everything that is hard in this image was preserved by ash. The plants have been re-established, but it gives us a good idea of the first glimpse we've had of cultivating a landscape near the home. This is the first piece of landscape you probably have seen in all my images so far that is intimate. Now, the Betty Eye brothers were incredibly rich. They were well off. And not everybody had this kind of a home. This uh, parasite garden would have allowed airflow to move through the house without allowing um, strangers to come and go from the home. So they didn't have windows and doors on the outside. They used these courtyards to increase airflow in the home. And then we got to the Nazca. The Nazca lines, um, there's a lot of mystery around these. At this point in history, we think that they were a ceremonial 
situation where you had some kind of a spiritual leader who led people on some kind of a march or an activity where they moved stones out of the way and they tramped the soil down. And they think that people actually did this in a bit of a drug-induced trance. So they would follow these guys for hours and hours and hours. But the really unique thing is this is in the desert below the mountains. You can only see this from up above. You can actually view it from the mountains. You can view it from a drone or a plane. But we're not really sure how they created these because they're several miles in diameter. But again, nature is at the forefront here. These are animals, of course, instead of plants. But it shows us what's important to them if it's part of their spiritual ceremony. All right, we want to move to the Middle Ages. I'm kind of grouping a bunch of centuries here because this was kind of a sad time in history. But we are going to talk about the rise of Christianity. So Christ died approximately 33 years after he was born. And Christianity really struggled for a while because it was considered a cult and it was persecuted and all of the disciples were murdered or martyred, however you want to view that. And Christianity took a very long time to get off the ground because the Romans were still fighting to keep their society together. And in order to keep your society together, your religion has to be intact. So eventually, Christianity took over. And I do want to remind everybody that at that point in history, there was one church. And it was the Catholic Church. The structure of Christianity revolved around the Pope and his entire hierarchy that was created based on the Christian beliefs that were translated from the Bible. So, for the next few hundred years, when we say the church, we mean the Catholic church, but we mean really the only Christian church out there, okay? Nature, at this point in time, is being used for survival. People are feeding from it, but it's kind of just out there. It's either something we're using to farm, or it's something we don't really want to be part of because it's scary and things kill us. Um, we also want to remember that monarchies and essentially the Catholic Church owns most of the land in Europe, and then the church kind of allows the kings, the monarchs, to pretend that they own it, but the church kind of played them against each other for several hundred years. And we can't have this conversation without discussing Islam, because even though I'm not talking a lot about Asia, Islam was actually the culture that did a lot of trading along the Silk Road. And we see Islamic influences. I don't have it in this PowerPoint. But our boulevards, our wide streets, are actually an Islamic invention. Because they realized they needed to plan ahead for city growth. So Islam played a huge role in our understanding of geometry and astronomy and most of our maths and sciences. And they were one of the few cultures that allowed women to be educated during this time. So the Moors were a fraction of Islam that settled in Spain. And today, if you visit Spain, much of their architecture is actually preserved. And so um, there's still a heavy influence in Spain, but it influenced all of Europe because of this. So here's a couple of those. This is at Alhambra. Um, and I have to admit, I can't find where I got these pictures. They got them a long time ago. So these are a couple that don't have any citation. But these images are present day, but this is preserved from this time period. So I know it's hard to see in this room, but the intricate detail is very important. However, this image right here should remind you a lot of Rome. Okay? So that Mediterranean parasitical garden was common. And water, right? I keep saying it. Think about water. Think about water. You have to be pretty influential to have water because at this time in history, irrigating is done by hand and creating pressure with downflow. This is just another image. Uh, fountains are highly important in our landscape development over time. And in this case, those are lions that line the fountain. And so again, power and prestige. But uh, the axes that we see joining at the fountain, it, that is an Islamic um, I don't have it on that slide. I have it coming up. It's an Islamic representation of the four corners of the earth. And so uh, you see these squares uniting at a central focal point repeatedly through Islamic design. Okay. Now, during this time, keep in mind, the church is kind of controlling the world. 
And part of that is because the church demands that every family, no matter your income, pays 10% tithe to the church. Now, if you're a monarch, that's a lot of money. If you're poor, it's all of your money, it feels like, right? Um, and yet, the church remained exempt from taxation in almost every monarchy. So money came in, no money went out. And this is how power and land ownership came to be monopolized by the Catholic Church. And they, as I said, were playing the other monarchs against each other. So if the king of France started to get too powerful, the church just shifted away from him. And this was pretty easy to control. But keep in mind, this is, I've talked about the classes. We still don't really have a middle class because knights were funded by people above them, and everyone below knights had to work for a living, so we don't really have a middle class yet. Um, this is the Cathedral of Exeter. I have to peek down here at the bottom, but this is an example of the overt use of money that the Catholic Church used to build their buildings. Now, at this time in history, castles and cathedrals are the only two things that we really hold on to with historical significance, so the landscapes around them are something to note. But most of the time, there wasn't a lot of landscape around them because we wanted it to be very prominent. We wanted God to see our creation. So you don't really see trees around it. You just see empty space. Um, keep in mind, this is sort of what life looked like, right? So upper class owned some kind of a walled protective structure, and everybody else sort of fended for themselves down below. Everybody else is growing food for the people above. This is a pretty rough life. So, in the two-thirds, late two-thirds of the Middle Ages, the Crusades began. Uh, again, the Catholic Church was kind of pulling people's strings. They wanted to rid the world of Islam culture. Uh, they wanted to take over the Holy Land. And at the same time, please bring back relics so that our church, our monastery, can be more important than the neighbors. And so, a lot of people needlessly died. This went on for quite some time. And this, I do think, might have caused a little shift in the, the Catholic Church's power because I think monarchs started to realize we're dying needlessly. But before that really could be a thing, people started dying from the bubonic plague. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the Black Death. It killed 20 million people in a very short amount of time, in about three years. And that was 30% of Europe's population. So that slowed growth down a lot. That slowed down taxation and everything related to it. So darn fleas caused this, um, very unsanitary conditions, people were living too close together and they really didn't understand science. So they were killing different people or pets needlessly, um, really just trying to figure out how to prevent this from spreading. But the Catholic Church did begin to lose control a little bit after the, the Black Plague because of a series of events that sort of coincided. So prior to them losing control, monasteries were where all education occurred, and only men were educated. Women were not, unless they held a very high place in a monarchy. But these monasteries were, they were the colleges of today. They were, they were where all knowledge was stored and all advanced skill was practiced. So I always fondly think back to monks as being the first horticulturalists. They were the, the ones who were practicing plant grafting. They were the ones who figured out genetics. Gregor Mendel was a monk. And this is, this is where, thankfully, they copied by hand ancient texts and maintained skills. But when the printing press was created in the 15th century, Martin Luther shook the world up. And the Protestant Reformation sort of hatched from that. Um, and I don't have it on here, but that also was really rocky. It took a long time for that to get a hold. And honestly, we have Henry VIII to thank more, probably, for Protestantism than Martin Luther, even though Martin Luther gets credit. So um, monasteries eventually lost their power when people could now get access to the printed word and people could learn to read. People taught each other and taught themselves and they could educate themselves. And now, the church is not the only people, the only place that education is maintained. So you can see how this is gonna evolve quickly. So, 
this process is called the Renaissance, and it, it translates to the rebirth. Now, we can't put a date on the Renaissance. It happened very slowly, but then all of a sudden, we realized it was here. And it was occurring mostly in Italy and France. Those were the two countries that drove it forward. Italy, more specifically. Um, and during this time, the, during this Renaissance, the Ninja Turtles did a lot of reintroducing of art, different forms of art. And so the classical, um, the, the classical uh, approach was brought back. But because of this renaissance, people can read now, people can travel. There's so much trade happening that it's, you can't slow it down, you can't take it back. And so cultural changes are beginning to happen really fast. So um, in the 1400s, we all probably had a picture like this in our textbooks when we were in fifth grade or so. And the age of exploration occurred. And this is when all the explorers thought they were either gonna sell, sail around the world or they were gonna find a shorter route to Asia, whichever they figured out. And in the meantime, they ran smack dab into a whole other continent. And that was the Americas. And it took them a while to figure out what it was. Um, we give Columbus credit for discovering it. We're gonna say he rediscovered it for sake of argument. But we see, I have several other people listed here, and Vespucci is actually the man who named it, right? He named this America. But the reason I bring this up is because we always think about them traveling from Europe to America, but all of these crops are American New World crops that traveled back to Europe. And this is gonna play a big role in our landscape because these are all vegetable crops except that is tobacco on the far left but it's very influential. So these others are food products that changed our landscapes. So uh, again, Islam comes back into the forefront around this time, and I actually just added this uh, Chahar Ba, I think is how you pronounce it, and it means paradise garden. So again, it's where those axes cross, and they represent the four corners of the world. And the spring at the center is supposed to be sort of that milk and honey ideal, okay? And you can see a lovely representation modern day down there that they've tried to show you what that would look like. So the Renaissance continued for a while, um, and this is where the classic form, the Ninja Turtles, really started to have a role because um, statues, sculptures, paintings were starting to become popular. So now we have somebody who does something that's art. Even today we say art is not always gonna you know, make you rich. Um, but these guys were able to be rich. They may be, these classical artists might have been some of the first true middle class employees. Uh, symmetry and grandeur. So I mean like things are symmetrical, but they are huge, okay? Uh, and then we also have pressurized and mechanized hydraulics that are really being pushed because, again, if you can control water, you're a pretty important guy. And we got one in particular here we'll look at. So this came about in France. The word is allay. And what is it? Can you think of something that sort of reminds you of that word? It means, it, it basically translates to alley, right? But when we look at these pictures, we probably think of our streets lined with street trees, which impacts our landscapes. I have some in my front yard, right? Now these alleys were intended to give the illusion of the never-ending horizon. So they were typically found at the front entrance to somebody's manor, home, castle, church, and the idea was that you're pulling up in your horse carriage, and it feels like it takes you hours to get from one end to the other because these trees create a wall on either side. And we still use that trick today. Streets look longer than they are because of this optical illusion. The not gardens of England and France were a really unique time in history that thankfully has faded away a bit. But this was upper class. Um, people created an activity called strolling, where walking about your garden for hours on end filled your day. So they created mazes. Now these are scaled down versions, but they created large mazes. And I think the Alice in Wonderland animated cartoon had a maze in it, a hedge maze. So you can kind of picture what I'm talking about. But these are small, but look at how intricate they are. They have those Celtic knot designs on purpose. 
They're made of boxwoods, but to maintain this requires almost constant care by a handful of gardeners. It can't just be one person. So in order to hire that many trained employees, again, you are of mean, of means, I'm sorry, and skill. They are of skill. This skill of gardening was passed down from father to son, like almost all trades. It was very limited. Women did not do it, only men. And many of our surnames come from these skill sets. My own, Bush, probably came from somebody who tended landscapes. My maiden name was Apple Garth, and that means apple orchard. So again, somebody who tended to apples. 1600s was the age of reason. The church has really kind of lost its grip at this point. So science is now being explored, but in a really gruesome way. Like in order to figure out anatomy and physiology, they're robbing graves and dissecting dead bodies. So that's exciting. Um, massive colonization of the Americas is happening in the 1600s. We have a lot of people coming over to escape religious persecution. Most of them are Puritans, and they're actually creating sort of their own weird little religious bubble, which is defeating the purpose. But um, the end of the 1600s was the Salem witch trials. Yes. Okay. So again, they created a weird cult that sort of killed people. But large-scale landscaping in the Americas especially continued because you have this whole country and no one to fill it. So here is, uh, I believe this is in France, this particular image. Um, but the Baroque style was a musical and a, a painting, uh, an art style. But you actually can see it in the landscape. So Baroque essentially means it's very flourish. It's got a lot of curves and, and way more than it needs. It's over grand. But look at how big this space is. This is huge. Now the purpose for this was to show off how much money you had. That's all it was for. You invite all the people that, that worship you, all the nobles, and they come and they pay you extra money to, to be there and you just show off. You're trying to outcompete. Now Versailles is part of this era. Louis XIV wasn't very well liked, so he moved out of Paris, slightly out of the city, and he created this little man syndrome complex. And he overindulged by a lot. Um, if you've been to Versailles and gotten to go inside, everything's got gold and jewels, and it's, it's obscene. But the outdoors is obscene as well. So this is the orange tree. Most of these trees are orange trees, but again, who needs that many oranges? This is a lot. Now, I wanted to show you this because Andre Lenoder was the uh, the first landscape architect, and he was uh, Henry the or Louis the Fourteenth's designer. You can see the scale at which he designed on the left over there, and then this is present day on the right. So I, I tried to line them up so you could sort of see what the intention was, and then what it has become. And when you look at it, you'll see a lot of things that go off into the distance for extended flow, extended axes, and there's not a lot of intimacy to this garden. It's quite large. It's too big for one person, but again, it's to show off. But, anybody know what this is over here on the right? It's Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C. was um, modeled after Lenoder's Versailles. And if you look at it with a discerning eye. You can see it's got those same axes, it's got the same diagonals, it's got the same alleys, the tree-lined streets. It's kind of fascinating. So here is um, DC and Versailles side by side again. Versailles on the left, DC on the right, and pretty identical. The Age of Enlightenment was the 1700s, so this is uh, speeding up again. French and American revolutions are happening. We broke away, created our own country in 1776. Um, scientific and technological advancements are happening, and now we can finally say there's a true middle class society. We finally have, in America, established that you are at the bottom, and we call those slaves, that you're in the middle, and you can basically sustain yourself, or you're at the top, and you are signing the Declaration of Independence. Those are the three classes. But in England, they had shifted to what we would call, today we call it the pastoral English landscape. Now the pastoral English landscape has all this grazing land, all this pasture land, and then odd 
plops of Greek architecture, just out in the middle of nowhere. So this is very common to see columns and arches and limestone that's left over from Greek and Roman era England just plopped in a pasture. Here we see it again. Again, this is a large park-like area with random buildings. But this was the style of pastoral England. Now this is an interesting piece of pastoral England. They have a lot of stone, so they build fences by moving the stones out of the field to create fences, because sheep really can't jump very high. But this is a special kind of fence called a ha-ha, -ha, which has one side of it hidden from view. Now we see these used in zoos, so that animals can't approach the people, but we also should recognize that this is really a retaining wall. And many of us have those in our landscapes as well. Uh, the cottage garden. The cottage garden came about in pastoral England, and the cottage garden was about cooking. It wasn't really about beauty. Uh, most of the flowers in the cottage garden were probably used for poison instead of for table decoration. Um, much of society, women throughout history, have used poisons or small doses of it as medicine. So the English cottage garden is a really represented one. Uh, this is Mount Vernon, any of you who have been to Mount Vernon. I cropped this photo a little bit because I wanted you to see the original design next to present day renderings of Mount Vernon. And of course, this is George Washington's home, um, and this would have been late 1700s, early 1800s. But uh, George Washington had, oops, I have two slides about, I'm so sorry, had four gardens. And what's interesting is they preserved them over all of these centuries to make sure that we understood what was grown in Washington's time. So he manned three of these. The upper garden is um, A, and you can see it's very symmetrical, but it was functional. It had a lot of plants in it that he grafted and he propagated and he practiced on. The lower garden was Martha Washington's, and that was the kitchen garden. Um, the slaves harvested from it mostly, but it was her pride and joy. And the botanical garden, um, and the fruit garden were both George's, and they were um, used to, again, breed plants. He was a very prominent plant breeder, and to produce orchards. He had a lot of uh, fruit trees gifted to him by other dignitaries, and so he planted them in the fruit garden. 1800s, the Industrial Revolution, I'm trying to get us to the end here, so I'm, I'm hurrying. But um, the 1800s, I'm primarily focusing on America at this point. In the 1800s, we saw a lot of people migrate out of rural parts of the world and travel to Chicago, New York, um, some of these more established cities that got very large. The urban populations grew very quickly. And because of that, true suburbia was born. The middle class needed a place to live that wasn't poor in the center of the city, where poor people tend to congregate, or on the very far outskirts of the city where the richest people live. So suburbia was the middle zone where they began to settle. And it's because they needed to commute into the city to work that they wanted to escape the squalor of the low class. And my favorite thing is that the national park idea was born in the late 1800s. Um, and this was the pet project of John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. But during this century in England, they were still transporting new found plants from the New World, and they would ship them across the ocean in something called a Wardian case. It was made of lead and leaded glass. It was super heavy. But it was our first greenhouse, and I know some people have greenhouses in their landscape. Um, and so I wanted to make sure we included the collection of plants as part of our idea here, because I'm a plant collector. I try to put unique things in my space, in my landscape. Um, we, again, see that England has now added a lot of color. So the rose garden, the color, the, the scale of things is getting a little bigger, a little more out of control, a little more cottage garden feeling, right? And yet again, more color. The, the borders along the walkways were now lined with flowers or plants to delineate where walking was supposed to occur. Some of our earlier images just showed big tracts of grass. Now keep in mind that would have been mowed with sheep because lawnmowers didn't exist until the late, late, late 1800s. And Frederick Law Olmsted, he gets, he gets a slide here because he was actually very influential in Boston, Chicago, 
and New York City. So this is Central Park. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted had the foresight with his partner Calvert Moe to say, if we don't preserve several city blocks of green space, the city's going to outgrow itself. And he was very intelligent because he preserved the original landscape, the rocks, the water, he kept it intact. And still today, all the space he reserved exists. Um, and then the 1900s, this is the first time in history we can really say that America is in charge of cultural change. So what we see in the 1900s is the biggest, the best, the worst of everything. And you guys are familiar enough with the history of the 1900s, I don't have to go through that. But revolutions of the workforce occurred during the civil rights movement and the labor law movement. So those were the 60s and 70s. That changed suburbia a lot. A, it allowed different races to live in suburbia, and B, it allowed people to have a 40-hour work week with designated time off so they could enjoy their backyard. So we haven't really seen things pull away too much from the English cottage garden, but this is early century. So this is called the country place era. And it was kind of a revitalization of what made us feel at home back in England. We saw a lot of people immigrating, and so we want to have familiarity. And then modernism kicked in in the mid-century, and modernism has not ended. Modernism is a very minimalistic, sharp, geometric look. The Sears Tower, those of you that are familiar with the Sears Tower, it is modern. That's the style. But this kidney shape, the reason I put this up here is this kidney shape, this organic shape, plopped into the landscape in the 1950s or 60s, and it has not left. If you think about your space, I bet you see these very organic looking shapes in your own landscape. Now part of the reason, it's called the arc and tangent, part of the reason that we include these is because they're easy to mow around. Sharp edges are harder to mow. So when landscapes are designed, we use these organic shapes, jelly beans, kidneys, whatever you want to call them, to make it easier. But we also see a lot of landscapes, especially in larger urban areas, that have this, this very modern, bleak, uh, sterile look to them. Anybody know who designed this? Famous architect of the modern era, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright, his intention was to design the home to fit the landscape. He was one of the first architects that said it's not about the building, it's about the space it sets in. And Frank Lloyd Wright has homes all over the U.S., including one in Nebraska, in McCook. And many of his homes have this very minimalistic landscape around it because the idea is for nature, the original landscape, to play a role. And then postmodern occurred late century. And postmodern is where we take these very built features and we create an interaction with them. So I have the 9-11 memorial on the left, and we, we view it, we don't swim in it or play in it or be disrespectful, but it's meant to be an interactive landscape piece. On the right here, this is Roy Hill Fountain at UNL's city campus, and it is a postmodern piece. People sit on those, they climb on them, they splash. It's meant to be enjoyed interactively, but these are traditionally more public spaces. You don't want to invite randos into your yard, typically. Um, but that wants, makes me want you to revisit your landscape. I want you to think about the quick history we went through. We had to leave a lot out, but I want you to think about for just a minute all of the things in your space now that you can say, I know where that comes from. So I will take any questions you guys have. Yeah, Key, please, if you could speak up in this space. whole history, what is the most significant change that you think took place, and do you have a personal favorite? 
don't know that I have a personal favorite, but I do think if we're going to talk cultures that were influential, the Romans were probably the most influential because the Greeks who preceded them just a little and the Romans actually classified most of our plants. And because of that, they were collecting them and they were purposefully creating landscapes near their home structures. And the Romans were pretty good about allowing everybody access to that and not keeping it so segregated where as we got through history some society said you must be rich to even be near trees So she, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Chloe was asking about, there's this point with the emergence of the cottage gardens of uh, some plants that were poisonous. Um, and if you could kind of clarify, were they used nefariously? Um, and did that eventually go out of style? Because you also talked about later gardens that were just about color. Or is that still part of cottage, uh, cottage gardens? So the Kew Garden in London, which is the oldest botanical garden um, that still exists, actually has an entire section of the garden dedicated to poisonous plants. And some of that comes from the fact that, I don't know if you know Catherine Medici, but she was, uh, the Medici family was the first mob family. They were the first loan sharks. They created banking. They actually kind of were the reason the Catholic Church fell because the Catholic Church borrowed money from them and they couldn't pay them back. But Catherine Medici uh, decided to become very skilled at poison. She used arsenic and nightshade and a series of other things that were untraceable, and she nefariously did use them to kill other monarchs and members of the Catholic Church. She was, uh, she was amazing. Um, but people in England probably didn't really use them for evil intent as much as the Medici family. However, things like foxglove can be used in very small doses to regulate the heart. Foxglove is found in all heart medications. But in anything over a tiny dose, it stops your heart. And so some of these are medicinal in their value. And did that go away at some point? Is that still common that people might grow plants that could be poisonous in major bits? And so it, de it depends. In American society, the, the native population still understands the medical benefits of many of those poisonous plants, and they still cultivate that history. The average suburban American does not probably practice or know that. Uh, the, the whole Solanaceae family, which is the potato and the tomato that came from America and the nightshade, they're all poisonous. But in order to die from eating a tomato, you have to eat approximately 40 of them in a very short amount of time. And so they're out there. You can study it. You can still kill people with it. You might get caught. Just shove tomatoes down their throat and eventually... I certainly have questions, but I, don't, I want to give you all an opportunity. Uh, to, um, uh, where would you like to see suburban landscapes go from here? So I actually do have a pretty good answer to that. COVID um, opened our eyes to the fact that very few people know how to grow and sustain their own food. And the suburban landscape is very unsustainable. Turf grass is one of the worst plants for society. It is a heavy drinker, it's a heavy feeder, uh, it really offers little to no value. And so I think suburbia needs to move back to having more edible landscape in their own space. Growing your own garden, having your own fruit trees, um, eliminating or reducing turf by a significant amount. So I'm kind of curious because a lot of this lecture was about class. Um, and the fact that, as you point out, for most of history, there's the rich, and there's the poor, and there's really no middle ground. But it seems to me, as you're talking about the emergence of a middle class and the things they're creating, it all just seems like rich people, what they're doing, but small. So, like, you talk about parks, right, with these grand parks that are just for the king, and then once the middle class get their, their hands on government, they're like, we need parks too. They're, we're not going to go crazy with them, but we want access to them. Water features. Is the middle class, is, are, 
are we just people that think we're on the edge of being rich? Is that, is, I don't know if that's an overstatement from this. It is, I wanna add a little bit to the park. So right before Frederick Law Olmsted was like, we have to preserve a green space in New York City or we will not have a green space in New York City. Prior to that, when people went to the park, they were actually going to cemeteries. Cemeteries were public parks and people would picnic and they would court and they would enjoy time in cemeteries. Now that view of death uh, shifted as society tried to be better than itself and so um, cities no longer let people be in cemeteries and they were like if you're going to do this we'll give you this green spot over here just go over there but don't don't be here and so uh, the view of death and city management really created parks for us but i don't really think the class system did that i think it was more of managing where we want people to go however yes most suburbanites are trying to keep up with the Joneses. I mean, that is the truth. Um, and so big lots and small lots are a reflection of the city, but it's a reflection of where do the rich people live. I also have a question about the that kidney shape. Because uh, as soon as you brought it up, like the very first time I ever got a little water feature in my backyard, and still if I go down and want to buy one, most of them are that kidney shape. Uh, I definitely recognize that type of setup. But you said that at the same time as the advent of modernism, where everything's angular. Was there, how did those two things, why did people think to put them together? I know you were saying that a lot of it is just mowing the lawn, but why didn't we make everything else smooth like that if that was the, the thought process? So keep in mind at the end of the 60s, you have another movement that I didn't discuss here that was hippies. So you have this very organic movement coinciding with this modern movement, and you have very, two very different groups of people who are trying to make their aesthetic the forefront. So we have kind of like the, uh, the house is already built, it's already square, the plat is already, and the hippies are like, I need me some curves in here, yeah. and they just plop it in the middle. It, that, that's the, and I'll leave this with my, as my last question. The idea of people just plopping things in, talking about like the pastoral movement, in England, is that, what does that say about what we're trying to accomplish? Because in other areas, like you look at Versailles, and it's all planned out. It seems like, or like you talk about those Muslim uh, landscapes, where it's very intricate, every detail is being paid attention to, but then it seems as we get closer to the modern period, and in the modern period, we kind of give up on that and just like, I'm just going to do a thing here. I don't care if it fits in with everything else. Is that accurate? So landscape design is uh, an economic function, right? Because not every middle class family can afford to have their landscape designed. So what we see instead is people will go to Earl May or a nursery and they buy plants and they plop them in like this particular image. So this has a style. It's called garden-esque and it means to collect and display. And it is very English in its background. Kew Gardens was actually created on that premise. Um, but most of our middle class doesn't take the time to pay for a designer. So the plopping, as you're describing, is what most of us do. Now, upper middle class and upper class, they tend to create those more formal landscapes that have a specific design and a specific skill set that makes them look finished, polished, sharp. Which, oh, oh, uh, Chloe was asking about People like Louis XIV that, you know, how many orange trees do you possibly, could you possibly need? And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you're asking that, uh, are they doing it because the town could have access to it? Or are they doing it just so that they could have the visual aesthetic of it? So, or does did Louis XIV just hella love oranges? So Louis XIV and Hadrian were actually two emperors that both chose this trick. So they moved the capital slightly outside the city. Hadrian was Rome, Roman. He moved the capital slightly outside the city and they created these huge acreages that were too big. They were, they were massive. Um, but 
it's, they did not share them. They did not let people come. You had to be invited. You had to be upper class. It is all about showing how important you are and how much you have. That sounds a lot to me like celebrities that buy these huge mansions that there's no way they can use the entire mansion. But if you're in the in crowd and you get invited, you don't want to be off that list. Right. So you might kiss that celebrity's butt a little bit more. Is that is when you talk about it, it, it sounds like it's not just about uh, showing off. It sounds particularly with these kings and emperors that it is a a manipulation tool to maintain power. Is that an yeah. overstatement? Oh yeah, it's an economic and social manipulation tool. But um, if you have control over the landscape or nature in any way, you're a pretty powerful person. Now. In today's American society, we believe we do. We see heavy equipment out there, moving dirt, moving land, building skyscrapers. We believe we have power over it, which is why we get so devastated when catastrophic events happen that are weather related or natural. And so this is where Western society struggles. But here in America, of course, we see ourselves as individuals and as a country as powerful. We like to feel that that we have that ability. Besides food plants, what are some like must-haves that you would recommend for the average suburban garden? So uh, two things that a suburban garden really needs to have. You need to have shade trees. Um, it's going to highly reduce your um, resource bill, your, your energy bill. And secondly, um, Oh my goodness, now I'm going to forget it. Secondly, you need to have... Pollinators? Oh, no, native plants. Yes, that, that got it. So native plants, because water will continue to be a finite resource. Uh, this has been one of our driest years in a while. And native plants will come out of this because they have a deep root system. They're adapted to the prairie. They're ready to go. Our turf grass and our other imported plants struggle with these extremely cold temperatures in these very dry or very wet years. So recommendations to any suburban homeowner would be get trees and native plants. Don't bring exotics into your space unless you understand it's a risk. And, and to piggyback off that, that sounds, because uh, I think one of the things that I hope we got this lecture series, but just in, in general, we all want to be the best citizens that we can be. Yeah. And it sounds like you're saying, not just because it lowers your own energy consumption, which is important, but planting native things does that affect, you know, I, I think like the birds in the area or the bees in the area, like, is that a civic responsibility of us if we, being a good citizen would include getting away from this lawn idea? Yeah, um, so cities suffer from something called the albedo effect, which basically means the reflection from buildings and concrete makes cities hotter than the surrounding rural areas. And so by planting street trees, you decrease that albedo effect and it actually does make your cities cooler. I can't tell you by how many degrees off the top of my head. Um, but the other interesting thing about trees is because they pull water out of the ground and it transpirates out of their leaves and evaporates off of their leaves, it actually creates a humidity cycle that allows it to rain. We're trapped in a dry cycle right now. There's not enough humidity in the air or in the ground and plants aren't transpirating and we cannot get precipitation to form. And so the deforestation of the Amazon, that is the biggest concern, is that it will stop raining in the Amazon if the trees are cut down. And so it is our stewardship responsibility to plant more plants, to plant more trees. So why do we have lawns? Is that always been a thing of rich people? or is Yeah, that a so I think, I think the American fascination with the lawn came from the White House. Uh, the White House was raised by sheep until the 1800s, and then the first lawnmowers were actually carpet shearing machines that were incredibly heavy, and it took several people to move them, or they had to hook them up to like a horse. But over time, that has become a status symbol. I never thought of that coming from the White House and the big lawn. Anybody else? So I do have a question about this, this idea that the trees help us with the humidity. So the fact that recently I've watched lots of farm grounds where they've torn out um, shelter belts, which help not only keep down like all of the erosion, 
but also just help with animals and things like that. Well, because we've uh, the, the price of grain has gone up so much, farmers want to farm from road to road. They don't want to leave shelter belts or have to work around them. So I've seen a lot of them torn out. So is this also part of this issue with drought? It is. And, and that, that practice is trending. I will say your mm -hmm. ag faculty at Northeast understand that, and we support leaving your shelter belts in place or planting buffer strips because they help with pollinators, they help with uh, pesticide and fertilizer movement. So we are still seeing a lot of young people who whose parents are practicing that, so the kids think it's the right thing to do. But we're trying to remind them that trees are a generational entity. Um, you plant it now, when you're 30 years, it means something. So to tear it out, it's going to take you 30 years to replace it. For every tree you remove, you have to plant at least three to replace the canopy area that you've taken out. So it is a problem to cut a tree down. So what do you mean by a buffer strip? What type of type of plants or what what would you put in a buffer strip? Buffer strips um, are going to be typically more of our prairie grasses but you can also see trees in them and, and buffer strips goal is just to stop chemicals from getting into our groundwater sources and so um, they do serve as habitat naturally because you're going to have a lot of wildlife that chooses to live there instead of in the field but um, a lot of our pollinators live in those buffer strips. You'll see people put beehives in those buffer strips. The, the cedar trees that have become such a problem. Cedar trees are a problem because we stopped burning. Before man settled the Midwest and decided we were going to farm road to road, lightning strikes happened all the time. So cedars are native to Nebraska, but they burned themselves out for centuries. And the problem with cedar trees that they keep putting up shoots everywhere? Is that the issue with them? They or, just, uh, or are they just ugly? Birds plant them. Birds plant them. And then, you know, once they get a little taller than that, fire will kill them. But historically, fire pretty much kept up with things. So we should hold that against our firefighters is what you're saying on video, Dr. Bush. <laughs> no. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, the, the last thing I just want to say is next month is our last hot talk of the spring. Um, Stacy Alday and Dr. Annie Corbett are going to talk with us about how statistics uh, can be used sometimes to maybe influence and influence us in ways that they shouldn't be used and how to maybe be able to see through how uh, they may be used. Uh, again, gathering this knowledge to create wisdom. Thank you all so much for coming out. Have a wonderful winter break. <laughs>